And Brian, you know what else is good as gold? No. This program, because we've talked about a little wrestling of current days, and now we're gonna we're gonna I told you this is gonna go my way. Are we are we far enough into the program where I can I can curse and and vent and rant if I don't get my way? Well, this or is your that show. Be, this is your well, show. Well, I don't want to be rude. But uh, I thought what we would do, for those of you who have been longing, as we have been, for a little classic wrestling discussion, before we talk about the big week the WWE had with The Rock and Cena and McAfee and <laughs> Taylor Swift is on the prize. I don't know what kind of stars they're pulling out here. We would go back and look at back when I was just a poor, underprivileged wrestling manager and or aspiring promoter back in the old days when I had to work on my birthday and and see what some of them looked like. How about that? So what year are we starting from? 82? We're start well, no, I didn't work on my birthday in 1982 because I was just doing TV at that point. I hadn't started doing any shows or whatever. I wouldn't do my first house show in, what was that, end of September? At the Cook Convention Center. Was it September 26, possibly? Did you take photos on your birthday ever at a wrestling show? Oh, God, yes. So you went to wrestling on your birthday is my Oh, point. God, yes. And even before... I did, my first birthday wrestling show was in 74. Lawler against Rufus R. Jones for the Southern Heavyweight title in a 19-man oh my God. Uh, pole battle royal. And all kinds of good stuff. But anyway, no, 1983 is my first year. But now, and, and we're not going to go through all of them. I've had a bunch of birthdays, fortunately. I baffle science. Uh, I've had a bunch of birthdays since then. We're not going to do all of them because in the modern era, you know, if, if your birthday falls on Tuesday, Wednesday, nobody runs that. Or I've been running my own business and they will take my birthday off, except when you are, you are around. And it, um. As a matter of fact, did you come to the New York show? My 50th birthday was at the Manhattan Center at a Ring of Honor event. Were you there that night? 2011. I don't think I was there for that. No, by that point, I was pretty pissed off with a few people involved with Ring <laughs> of Honor. So in order to not embarrass you, I stayed away. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, we may have seen you on that trip. I don't know. but uh, But that's... The last major time I think I worked on my birthday, I can't remember. But nevertheless, I, we th I thought we would go through some of these select years. I got my books out and see what I was doing and how I variously... Uh, I've been fucked around a lot on my birthday in a wrestling business as I come to reflect on these books now. September 17th, 1983... To take, like you said earlier in the program, now does it count the whole 24-hour period when the clock turns midnight? So I'll start at midnight. I had been in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, in front of a $3,750 house and make $70 to manage the grapplers against the Rock and Roll Express, the assassins against the fabulous ones, and wrestle in a battle royal. Where is that? Comparison Hopkins to Louisville. Hopkinsville is out in the western part of the uh, state, out near Eddyville and Paducah and that, uh, you know, more central western. And it's actually uh, not far from the Tennessee state line. My Uncle Dink, Dink Embry, used to be the morning man on WHOP Radio AM back in the, in the good old days in Hopkinsville. Uh, but then... It, I can't remember whether it was a school or the armory or whatever, but we would get out of there about 10, 10, 15 at night and had to go to Memphis for TV. So that was 245 miles and we're starting at 10 o'clock and you would get in like two or three o'clock in the morning. And that's why by this point in time, I was living in Nashville with the, my first six months in the business. I was in Louisville. So I was making all the trips by myself because nobody else lived in Louisville and was starting and ending up in the same place. But even when I moved to Nashville, when I came back from Georgia that summer, like I've said, I'd ride with Bobby Eaton or, you know, he'd ride with me a lot of different places. And, you know, but then 
toward the fall, not only did I start getting booked on the buttermilk runs where they were running two towns a night, so a lot of guys would be maybe on one shitty town and then the good town the next night, but I'd be on all the shitty ones. But I always went to Memphis on Friday nights by myself for TV because the guys, they wanted to dick around or they wanted to eat somewhere or they wanted to drink or, you know, stay at the hotel where all the girls were going to be. Fuck it. At that point in my career, if I was going to get six hours of sleep or less and do live television, I went straight into Memphis, hopped off at the Red Roof Inn on Sycamore View Road, got a room for like 21 fucking dollars. As a matter of fact, it should be out. $21. It's it's marked down here. And then I would get up the next morning and make sure I was at TV early so I knew what the fuck was going on and I could try to figure out what I was doing. So I did that two hour boom, get in at three o'clock, whatever, be at TV 10 o'clock the next morning. And then that night, my birthday night, we were in Corinth, Mississippi, which is not far from Memphis, only 90 miles. And so, you know, you had time to dick around and eat at the New Orleans famous fried chicken place or whatever after TV. And then Corinth, unlike Tupelo, which had been run every Friday night since the dawn of time in one of the shittiest buildings I've ever worked in and was tired and beat up and wore out and didn't draw and nobody cared. Corinth. Beyond that. A, beyond that. Corinth had a nice big fucking gym, I think, at a school there, and it did $9,500. And this was when, a figure of $5 average ticket, that was 2,000 people. So that was just swell. And that night, I only had one, two, three, I only had to work four times. I managed Dennis Condry, who beat. Ken Wayne, who was working as the stray cat. Uh, I managed uh, Frank Morell and I believe Duke Myers as Lucifer and the Prince of Darkness when they got beat by Terry Taylor and Bobby Eaton. Me and Jimmy Hart lost a handicap match to Coco Ware, and I got eliminated in the Battle Royal. But I made a hundred by God dollars. Was Coco stiff? Um, no, Coco wasn't stiff, and and plus. <laughs> You know, it 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 was it wasn't like he was gonna fuck with us on purpose because we had to do shit, and also we were the managers. We were hitting him from behind more than he was hitting us in the front. So no, I be, he wasn't drop kicking me or Jimmy like he you would see the videos of him hitting the job guys or whoever with the drop kick off the top rope. It was it was a spot show match. And then I got in the car, and it was only 170 miles back to Nashville. So I was back home by 1 in the morning. So I'd left Nashville at probably 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon, worked a show in Hopkinsville, worked three times, drove 240 miles to Memphis, did a TV that morning, drove 90 miles to Corinth, worked in four more matches, and then drove 170 miles back to Nashville and got back at 1 o'clock Sunday morning. That was my birthday for $170 total. Your thoughts. <laughs> do you say anything to anyone or do you know, sell that it's your birthday? Uh, well, I no. I mean, it, it's not like I went in expecting cake or whatever, but if anybody said, how you doing? I say, hey, it's my birthday. Oh, well, happy birthday. Now you're going to fucking do a job for goddamn Coco. I didn't know if that was the kind of thing that guys would just right away start ribbing you on. If you started announcing it was your birthday to everyone. Well, no, I, you wouldn't you love go your in. birthday. <laughs> well, no, yeah, I, now I do because I've had so many of them and I didn't expect to have this many. Back then it was, I still hadn't done it that much and it wasn't that big a deal. If somebody asked me how I was that day, I'd say, well, I'm good. It's my birthday, but I wouldn't go in going, it's my birthday. See, if it was nowadays, all the fans on the internet would know it was your birthday and then they'd start chanting that to you at the show. And then you'd have to do something where you break a fam and thank them for coming. <laughs> No, I would have just asked them all for cake. Well, you do that anyway. But anyway, that was 1983, by the way. And uh, we'll revisit the rest of that year at some point in the future. You, your favorite year is 1984. Would you like to hear 1984? 84 Mid-South, the best. 
In 1984, on September 17th, I was in New Orleans, Louisiana at the Downtown Municipal Auditorium. What day of the week do you know? That's a Monday night. Yes, I'm looking at the book right here. It was a Monday night because New Orleans was still at that point running. It used to be a weekly town on Monday night every week. And then in 84 and with dog leaving, it got to be intermittent and then started going to the lakefront arena for some of the shows, blah, blah, blah. But this was the old downtown building. And we were living in Alexandria, Louisiana at that point. So it was 200 miles exactly from Alexandria to New Orleans, and the first, I'm going to say 120 miles of that was two-lane road. So it was a, from Alexandria, I mean, driving like bats out of hell 40 years ago when there was less traffic, it was still every bit of three and a half hours to get down there, right? <clears throat> so you left because you had to be there an hour beforehand, and bell time was 7.30, so you left at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and if you were the main event, by the time you got out of downtown, they had to clear the people out of the, you know, area first so you could get to your car. You weren't back home till 2 o'clock if you were the main event, easily. When you're doing that many miles regularly for a year, a little over a year, actually, are there any local shows, or not even local, just any programs you hear on the radio that you start to like just because of the regularity of hearing different personalities and different things? Well, no, because we were never in the car in the morning when all the, per we, we were always, you know, in the afternoon, listening afternoon, evening, and the middle of the night. And we just, and we're going past and through so many different radio station markets. We just hit the fucking button till we found some fucking classic rock. Well, it, it wasn't classic rock then. It was just rock. And that, you know, it was a blur. It was a fucking blur. And the stay, you would, you would leave the station and it would start staticking and you'd fucking just turn the thing until you found something else that you liked. So when you think about 84 Mid-South being in the car, what songs come to you right away? Like if you hear this song, no, you're going to think about being in that car. There is, there is one, the Eagles, because Dennis Condry used to make a joke out of this. This was 1984, right? When was the, the Eagles, the long run album released? 79, maybe 78, 80. Was it 80? Okay. Point being, you like them a little better than I do. Well, point being, the Eagles, Dennis would say, we're the hottest fucking band on the goddamn radio in Louisiana. We suddenly went back in time four years and they played the Eagles constantly on every radio station in that territory. And that was the fucking rib. You couldn't get away from them. But that, you know, that was in those days, it was a joke. I don't even think it was confined to the wrestling business. You're now entering Louisiana, set your watches back 20 years, especially in the rural parts, Alexandria and Lake Charles, Lafayette, you know, Baton Rouge and New Orleans was a little, you know, more up tempo, but oh boy. But that's what I'm asking too, because like the Rock and Roll Express exploded Mid-South in 84 and MTV, from what you know, how available was it in any of those markets? and you know, that's the thing, like the Rock and Roll Express videos are like the Van Halen jump and various things. Was that music on the, like, do you think of that? Like, yeah. Do you, do you no, hear that yes. in the car? Oh, yes, it yeah. was all over the, Van Halen was all over, jump was all over, whatever the rock and roll was coming out to was what was all over the radio. But also, Louisiana had cable in all those markets. They were shitty little local cable systems. But... It, it, the thing was, as you might recall, some of the smaller markets in the country got cable first because it wasn't like New York. It wasn't this giant multi-billion dollar thing they were bidding on. It was like, yeah, let's go put fucking cable in goddamn Bogalusa. Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. So MTV was huge in 1984 and the radio and Van Halen and they were they were seeing the goddamn same things everybody else was seeing it was just it was a little bit more primitive fucking there were no north and south interstates you had i-10 from east to west at the bottom of the state and i-20 from shreveport crossed through to jackson mississippi at the top of the state and everything else was two-lane bullshit and you would find some backwoods motherfuckers just so you know but anyway 
On September 17th in New Orleans, Louisiana, I managed Hercules Hernandez and Dr. Death against Hacksaw Duggan and Terry Taylor, where um, Dr. Death smacked Terry Taylor with the helmet, and we beat oh. him one three. Is that the famous one? Like, they had the video of it because he got busted open? Uh, or it hit him in the eye? Been. Is that what it was? It may have been. Remember they used to do those videos in Mid-South, like, people say wrestling's fake. I'll show you how fake it is. And it would just be guys getting busted open. Oh, yeah. And just on fucking their head. stitches and <laughs> dropped on their head and fuck it. Yes. And then the main event that night was the Midnight Express against the Fantastics for the Mid-South Tag Team title with no disqualification. And it was a wild fucking melee. And then, as I recall, I think this was, I think Dundee was off and this was a Grizzly Smith finish because Bobby Fulton went to give Bobby Eaton an atomic drop and he had to do it close enough to the ropes that I could jump up on the apron and push Bobby Eaton's feet and he fell backwards on Bobby Fulton, one, two, three. That was the finish of a no disqualification match. That's why I think, I think Grizzly may have been filling in. So this is September in New Orleans. When was the angle with the... Straight jackets. Uh, the oh, no, the straight jackets are rock oh. and roll. The contract signing with the Fantastics, with the uh, the famous chair shots. Oh, with the chair shots. Yeah, because the straight jackets we did on TBS with the Fantastics. Yeah. Um, hold on here. Let me go back to see if I can find the TV tapings. Uh, today, and we're already doing the deal with them. Ah, con replay contract signing in show 262. That means it was in show 261. So that, had, that we had shot that August 29th, but it aired all, all through September at various points in the territory. So that's what I'm trying to figure out, what exactly you guys were doing. You know, this is a no DQ match. What would have set it up? That was one of the most well, vicious well, angles that people still talked about, those chair shots, seeing the dents in the chair. It's like the first time you ever saw that in wrestling. But what... Uh, and. <laughs> Because poor Bobby and Tommy were trying to get over like crazy, and they told Bobby, lay him in. But what set this up particularly was the September 3rd show in New Orleans. Um, that's the night that Hercules against Duggan with my hair versus Duggan's hair. <laughs> and Dr. Death was the referee, and Doc and Duggan were friends, but I paid Dr. Death off. He switched heel. And we fucked Duggan, but they came in the ring and goddamn shaved me anyway. We told that story. But earlier that night, uh, the Fantastics had wrestled the Midnight, and we had gotten disqualified. I can't read my writing anymore. Um, ah, we got disqualified for Bobby throwing the powder at uh, Bobby Fulton, but hitting the referee in the eyes instead. So we came back with a no DQ match that night on the 17th because it makes sense imagine that could you have done it another year if you hadn't gotten to world class and you didn't have mid-atlantic lined up could you have done the schedule Are you young enough and had enough no. energy okay no i'm about to tell you why because here's the fucking rib as i went back and looked at this i look okay that was september 17th 1984 do you know the previous day off that i had had in the Mid-South Wrestling Territory, where I hadn't done a house show or a TV taping or a set of interviews or potentially all three in the same day. The previous, before September 17th, my previous day off. Spring. Oh, God damn it. Give me, just blurt a date out. Just blurt a date out. I'm trying to think, when was this? When was that? Early May. Well, thank you, Ed McMahon. June 18th. Damn it. July, August, three months before my birthday was the previous day I had off. Do you know what the next day off that I had after my birthday? And I didn't have my birthday off, but I'm saying the following, the next day off I had in Mid-South Wrestling after June 18th. No. October 14th. October 4th. Now, wait a minute. Hold on here, though, because I want to tell you. Does that automatically? I want to tell you. Does that automatically mean the same thing for Bobby and Dennis? No, because here was the problem. And also, I didn't take off all of October 14th. Let me tell you this. Let me talk to you. So in Mid-South, at that point over the summer, I'd started managing 
Hercules Hernandez. And then when he was partners with Dr. Death and Tags, I was working with them too when Doc had switched heel in the angle we just did, right? So if the Midnight got a precious day off, if Dr. Death or Hercules were booked, I still went. Also, at this period of time, Mid-South Wrestling was legitimately running a live event every night of the week, seven days a week, every day of the month. In addition to that, on Sunday, more often than not, I would say 80% of the time, it was a double shot, a 2 o'clock in the afternoon show, and then 7.30 at night in a different city. In addition to that, every Wednesday, no matter where we were booked on a Tuesday night, or no matter where we were booked on Wednesday night, every couple of weeks it was in Shreveport for TV taping, but it could be 280 miles away in Greenwood, Mississippi, but all the top main event talent would be in Shreveport at the TV station from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. on Wednesdays to cut the local promos for all these live events we're doing. So, you literally worked eight wrestling shows a week and did six hours of interviews every day or every Wednesday on a day you're also doing a show that night. And the double shot on Sunday. A double shot on Saturday was not unheard of, but not regular, thank God. But some weekends we did do four live events. And every two weeks was a TV taping where they did two one-hour TV programs. And if you were a main event guy, you often worked on both those shows, which meant that you would now have wrestled nine matches that fucking week. What about local promos? With the local promos, there was 20, did he have 20 or 22 TV markets? So you did 40 or 44 local promos every Wednesday. Two minutes each. And so with that schedule, I had started on June 18th. And by the way, we've talked about it. It was 3,000 miles a week a lot of times in a car. Uh, if you didn't fly to Oklahoma, it was 4,000 miles that week. And so you were, t there was no goddamn time to think about what you were doing to realize that you shouldn't really be able to do this. I mean, just the week of August 6th through August 12th, 400 to 630, 730. Um, hold on. That's 400. If 1130, 1330, 15 to 16. Oh, we did 1,600 miles that week, but that's because we flew from Little Rock through Oklahoma and back, or it would have been 3,000. So anyway, then the point is, on October 14th, we had a goddamn double shot. We had to go from Alexandria to Pine Bluff, Arkansas for an afternoon show, cage match against the Fantastics. That was 230 miles of two-lane road, so we'd have to leave at like 8 in the morning. And then on the way back, about 130 miles, we'd stop in Monroe and work against the Rock and Roll Express that night, and then I'd manage Duggan against Hercules. And then come another 100 miles back. So we would leave at 8 o'clock in the morning. We'd get back home about 1.30. But I had to call in sick because I couldn't drag myself out of bed to go to Pine Bluff. And I went to Monroe that night because, you know, I was booked. I had to. I didn't want to fucking get fired. I was already called in sick on the afternoon show. And I made two more fucking shows. New Orleans on Monday and Shreveport on Tuesday. And they actually, the Fantastics got five minutes with me on Tuesday night. And then we did interviews on Wednesday morning. And I said, I'm, I'd started feeling like 15 minutes after I got up in the morning, like I hadn't slept in three days. I had no, I couldn't get up off the couch. I couldn't open my eyes. I was nodding when I was standing up and I was having this pain in my abdomen. And so they said, don't go to Lafayette, go to the fucking doctor. So I went home to Alexandria, went to the doctor and they told me I had mono. And I don't know if they even still have that. You don't hear about it anymore. 
But mom, no, they did, still have it. They, do I, they? I, yeah, um, my older daughter, she knows a kid who just went to the hospital, got mono. Well, you know, they used to call it when I was a kid the kissing disease because you could transmit it. It's something with your immune system. I, this is 40 years ago. I saw this fucking doctor in Alexandria. I don't know. He could have been a goddamn veterinarian. But it's an immune system thing or whatever. Your immune system gets worn down. I don't fucking know. They said my pain in my abdomen was from my internal organs swelling and blah, blah, blah. And we narrowed it down because Terry Taylor at the same time took a month off almost because he had mono. <laughs> and I knew that I had not kissed Terry Taylor nor him me. But we narrowed it down at the interview sessions on Wednesdays at Channel 3 in Shreveport. The only place to get anything to drink they had in the break room, they had a goddamn Coke machine. And it was one of those fucking, the old time machines. It wasn't cans and it wasn't plastic. They didn't have plastic bottles with screw off caps. It was the goddamn, remember those thin, tall, like 10 or 12 ounce Pepsi bottles? Are you old enough? For I that? know what you're talking about. Sure. Okay. Well, you got bottles out of the machine and all the boys had bottles of soft drinks sitting on their tables when they're doing promos. And I swear to God, I either I drank Terry's or he drank mine, and we got the same goddamn thing. You didn't think maybe it was a girl? Oh, for heaven's sake. I wouldn't... He, we had much different taste back in those days. Just there was like a kissing bandit running around? Well, no, there was no, there was no kisses stolen. They were freely given away. Do you, um... When you did the five minutes with the manager, if you're the heel, that means you're doing all the bumping, all the selling, everything... Does it take forever, like in your head? Is it five minutes or is it an hour? No, because it don't last five minutes. Unless, here's the thing. It's usually, it's not a tag team usually. We did at the Great American Bash, both the Fantastics got me. And I think Tommy punched me and Bobby slammed me and they double clotheslined me and beat me one, two, three. When it's a single heel against the manager, then that's when the manager, to Shane Douglas's great consternation, throws powder in his eyes and chokes him with a rope and gets some steam for about a minute and a half for two minutes so that people can get pissed off so that then he can clear his eyes and make the comeback like Ronnie Garvin did in the matches we've talked about and fucking beat me by throttling me around my neck and having my shoulders pinned so it's not like he's not even really finished with me yet, but boom, we get out of it and I'm drug out. You get out quick. So it doesn't last five minutes, except if the manager is somehow going to prevail in some freaky way. But nevertheless, where I prevailed was home for a week. This is the longest besides surgery that I ever had to take off of wrestling because I was sick. Seven days. They told Terry Taylor take a month off, and I think he did, because he and also he was a wrestler. They told the doctor said, you need to take a month off. You need to get as much rest as possible. You need to eat a healthy diet. Because imagine what our diet was like at that point. Mine especially. Yeah, Terry Taylor was in good shape. Yeah, but imagine what, what mine was like in those fucking thousands of miles in the car and this fucking schedule. I was, I, every, in Alexandria, every lunch I had was either McDonald's chicken nuggets or from goddamn 7-Eleven every day of my fucking life. So they said, take a month off, get rest, eat a healthy diet, take vitamins. You know, there's no cure for this. I said, ah, I'll see what I can do. So I took off Lafayette, Louisiana, La Ronja, thank God, Hamburg, Arkansas, Little Rock, goddamn it, Oak City and Tulsa, it killed me too and Lake Charles and Baton Rouge. No, Baton Rouge, we were already off, thank God. I would have got a day off. And I went back to interviews and Shreveport TV on the 24th because that was the goddamn straight jacket angle with the Rock and Roll Express. And so I had to be there. And after seven days of sitting in the house, eating healthy as I could and sleeping, I went back to work and I did another, let's see, that's one week. That's, uh, 
You know what? That's uh, I worked another two weeks straight, and then we started having a couple of days off because we by November we were about ready to finish up. But they almost killed me. That was over a hundred and something days in a row of doing those trips and those shows and getting bumped around and sweating the summer in goddamn Louisiana and the Gulf of Texas and eating like shit and hardly ever sleeping and screaming for fucking hours at a time. <laughs> it almost killed me. That was 1984. Well, don't worry, 85, at least the first half of 85, you got to uh, get some rest. Well, that's the thing is, uh, that's why when we went to Dallas and realized what the money was like, we weren't happy with the money, but the schedule was, it was almost like we existed again. Uh, we went to restaurants and, you know, had days where we just sat around the house and watched TV and things were close. We didn't have to drive two hours to, you know, Alexandria, Louisiana, 40 years ago, was not a goddamn happening location. And I'm not even, I'm, you know me, I'm not a disco pro. I couldn't go to the fucking movies there, not only because we didn't have time, but if somebody recognized me, they'd jump me in a fucking theater. But in Dallas, you could go to the fucking movie and reasonably expect that probably in the dark, most people ain't going to, even though you're on TV, it's Dallas. They're not going to really think you're going to be there. They're not, and they're not going to harass you because the Dallas Heels didn't have the heat in the Metroplex that the, any of the Heels in Louisiana did. So we could go out in public and do shit. So we were there for six months, but finally we had to, we had to say sayonara. But guess where I was now? Bear in mind, at least in 84, I'm making fucking thousands of dollars a week, right? And all those towns were fairly good. In 1985, we had just started for Crockett. And you're in we Georgia. Were you're we were in still Georgia. in Georgia, yeah. right? The 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 moribund Georgia territory that was about to be absorbed into Charlotte. So on September 17th was a Tuesday in 85. I was in Chattanooga. And the Midnight Express beat Pez Watley and the Italian Stallion. And the house in Chattanooga was $4,700, and we made 80 bucks. <laughs> was the Italian Stallion ever any good? No, Stal was a good guy. He was a funny guy. And people like the boys like saying as a person. I mean, having him ring. around. Actually, if you went back and you, if, not if you went back, but if the Italian Stallion of 1985 was a wrestler today, you would think, wow, that guy has great basics. And boy, he's pretty good. Because it's, it, it was a whole different fucking, you were looking at everything with different eyes then. But, and also, Stal had the, the largest head on a human being in the fucking world. Yeah. And it, we used to joke that... That's uh, what I look for in my baby faces. Well, no, that's the thing. The headlock was ineffectual because you couldn't reach around it. It was fucking, he used to drive Jimmy Valiant all the time. Jimmy would meet Stallion at this convenience store off of Highway 61 there in Charlotte to get, to, to get a ride to Rock Hill. It was 13 miles away. And we'd pass by on the way to Rock Hill. There'd be Boogie's car sitting in the fucking parking lot where Stallion had picked him up so he could drive him 13 miles. <laughs> and they used to... They used to go when they were going to the spot shows out in Western North Carolina or whatever. They had all these stops where they knew they had stopped before and they had encountered fans, fans that ran grocery stores, fans that ran restaurants, fans that ran convenience stores. And they knew the stores to stop at where these people would just give them bags of groceries or food or shit. Here, here. And so they paid for nothing. And so they'd have to go out of their way sometimes to hit these places, but they were off most of the main highways. But anyway, that's what I did in 1985. But the interesting thing was that week, that following Sunday, was the first ever Midnight Rock and Roll Express match in Charlotte at the Charlotte Coliseum. That Sunday, November, or not November, but September 22nd. Wow. So we, because that's the thing, Crockett knew that the Georgia office was about to close. We'd come there. First of July, it's now the middle of September. It, it ain't working. He's going to, uh, he's, uh, 
they had commitments because of what Ole had been doing in the office down there to to run some of these buildings and run some of the Georgia spot shows. So they had to honor them. But as they were finishing that up, there was no reason to keep that guys down there anymore. And we talked about they were given the Sawyers their fucking notice. Um, the previous day, Monday, September 16th, in Unadilla, Georgia. Unadilla, Georgia. A $2,500 house, and the payoff was $60. And it was supposed to be Buzz Sawyer and the Raging Bull against the Midnight. I think Bull wasn't there, so Bobby had a single match with Buzz Sawyer and beat him. And Buzz was not happy about doing those jobs. And then we did Chattanooga. Then they brought us up to Raleigh and Madison Heights, Virginia, and Columbia, South Carolina, and Charleston. The rest of that week, we're starting to go into the North Carolina, into the territory. But that Sunday, the 22nd, here's a fucking deal. We start out with, I'm at Atlanta TV that morning because we're still living in Georgia. We're still living in Atlanta. And we're not going to move until the first week of October. So they have the Midnight Express booked against the Italian Stallion and, oh my God, what was, Reeves, what was his first name? Local guy. Anyway, just to get them over in Asheville, North Carolina, it's their first appearance, but I need to be on Atlanta TV. So after Charleston, South Carolina, I drove back to goddamn Atlanta, 260 miles, and then uh, fucking did Atlanta TV the next morning, and then drove up to Charlotte, where we did the rock and roll match that night at the Coliseum, and then back to Atlanta, where meanwhile the midnight had gone from Charleston, the farthest you can go in South Carolina, all the way to one of the most westernmost parts of North Carolina for an afternoon show, and then gone back to Charlotte the wrong way, and then had to go back to Atlanta that night. There you go. What about 1986? 1986, that was the best year ever for Crockett Promotions. And do you know where I was and where I was working on September 17, 1986? I mean, I could just pick a town unless it's something like outside that would be like painful, like Kansas City or something. No, I wasn't working at all. We were at the NWA convention in Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh, wow. And this was the rib. You know, we've talked about it. Every year, the National Wrestling Alliance, since it had been formed, had an annual convention. All the promoters got together. They brought their top guys, their top talent, either their bookers or the people they were lobbying for to potentially be the world champion. Only the top talent and the, you know, the big promoters went to the NWA meeting, right? And that's where they picked the world champion. And they, you know, got together, did all their how to get out of antitrust issues and all that other stuff. That's where the business was done, right? Well, by 1986, Crockett is pretty much the NWA. And, you know, there's there's a few other member promoters, and I think Baba was still involved, obviously. And so Crockett just decided he was going to decide where the meeting was. It was going to be in Las Vegas. And as a present, he was going to take, like, the top 16 guys, 18 guys or whatever on the roster and fly us all out to Las Vegas for three days to have the NWA convention meeting. And so that's the first time I went to Las Vegas. It was the 15th, 16th, and 17th, a Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, because he didn't want to give up any fucking weekends where, you know, he could actually gross some money. But and so that's the first time I got to go to Las Vegas, and that's why it was just a vacation for all the boys. And they did the same thing next year, as we'll talk about in a second, but they could, they uh, convened a meeting with everybody there and passed a couple of fucking whereases and then unconvened and spent the rest of the next three days just jacking around in Las Vegas. And and Crockett wrote the fucking deal off. 
It was a tax expense. It was the annual meeting of the NWA. Uh, Jim Crockett knew what he was doing with money and taxes, of course. Just write it off. Just just, just write it off. How much is that jet? I just, just write it off. Yeah. Just write it off. So... So anyway, I mean, and I was never a gambler, but I liked, I got to like the video poker. That's, that's why Flair one year, he got me this little desktop video poker machine because I, that's every time he'd see me in Las Vegas, I was playing the video poker. And we, I, I, with my, I didn't have Stacy at the time. I would have been in jail. She would have been like eight. Um, but my first wife, we went to Hoover Dam and Lake Mead. I took pictures took picture that the strip was still it wasn't all the mega resorts back then it was still like the sands and the dunes and caesar's palace and it still felt like the rat pack yes you could see the goddamn the same they had the same neon the same signs as the classic street pans that they would do so i took and still have pictures of all of that shit and of you know murdoch had told me you got to go to the to the steakhouse at Circus Circus, and I did, and oh my God, it was incredible. And all the old shit he knew he knew uh, Benny Binion, him Murdoch himself. Every time he went to Las Vegas, he got comped whatever at Binion's. Did you take a camera with you everywhere you went, or was it just for this special occasion? No, because it was Las Vegas. No, on the fuck, I wouldn't have had the camera long if I took it on a lot of these trips. But because it was Las Vegas, yes, you know, did that and. Uh, and ended up having a just a fine old time there, and then came back <laughs> on the 18th, the day after my birthday, we came all the way from Las Vegas to Green Bay, Wisconsin, for a world tag title match with the Rock and Roll Express. But that, um, yeah, and as a matter of fact, that weekend was the big street fight match with Dusty Rhodes and Bubba Rogers in Greensboro. We got a thousand dollar payoff on. And then did Atlanta TV and Charlotte on the Sunday after our debut in Bloomington. It was quite the travel uh, at that point. But You know what else happened on that day in 1986? What? The Mets clinched the National League East. And we were at the Mets Center in Bloomington. Dwight Gooden beat the Chicago Cubs uh, the way things should be. And the Mets and the fans stormed the field for the last time ever in New York sports because... They destroy Shea Stadium And then so they put badly. up a fence, right? <laughs> well, no, it, you know what? It creates such an ugly visual. The Mets, when they win in 86, and basically every New York team after, the, well, New York baseball team, the Mets or the Yankees, they win. As soon as they win, the gates open, and cops on horses come riding <laughs> down the line. Like, you're not getting past that, you know? And then you get to see, like, past the cops and the horses your team's celebrating. <laughs> but you don't get to go on the field and body check them and steal their hat and eat mud and all the things that people used to do. Homie, eat mud. Let's go Mets. Well, you know, but now I'm 25 years old, Brian, in 1986. Thankfully, you could ar you could rent a car back then. I never had anybody argue with me renting a car. I rented all the, all the cars for the midnight and had been doing that for the previous couple of years. Nobody ever said a goddamn word. But now it was legal, I guess. I gave you a little preview, but where do you think I was in 1987? You were at the NWA convention in uh, Charlotte. No, I was at the NWA convention in St. fucking Martin. Oh, wow. And oh, yeah, wow. Now, here's the goddamn deal. Write it off. Just write it off. Yeah, well, anyway, I'm about to write this fucking place <laughs> off. <clears throat> so what had happened was we had had a nice little round the world. This was when Crockett had bought the UWF and he was running more different towns, right? So we had gone to Memphis on the 11th, $20,000 house, because we couldn't draw in Memphis because Lawler wasn't involved. With the Midnight Express and Bubba Rogers against Dr. Death and the Road Warriors with me and Skandor Akbar in a small cage. And uh, all the stars, Memphis sucked. Then we go to St. Louis, and it's a $55,000 house. Uh, Dusty and Hawk against the Midnight Express because Animal was, for some reason, injured. And then we went to Cincinnati for one of the worst houses in the history of Cincinnati, Ohio, $9,600. And we were against Jimmy Valiant and Kendall Wyndham for the U.S. Tag Team title. So then we all leave for St. Martin, which 
I don't know how to describe for the people who don't know where it is, where the fuck it is. St. Martin is down. Can you describe where St. Martin is? It's an island. It's an island. In the In the Atlantic. island area. Yeah. It down, it's not Puerto Rico. It's not, it's somewhere. I don't fucking know. Think you know the song Kokomo? Yeah, there are they in there too? It's implied. Bermuda, Jamaica. It's implied. St. Martin's implied, I believe. The West is. Indies, is that somewhere near? I don't think that's in the song either, no. John Stamos I'm talking is about is, is the West Indies near St. Martin. Which West Indies? The real ones or the ones Columbus thought the he was? The real ones. Oh, okay. I don't know. The point is, look it up, folks. But M-A-A-R-T-E-N, St. Martin. <laughs> point is, they've got the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th, and they're doing the NWA meeting and the same thing. Crockett's going to fly the top 18, 20 guys. It was me. It was Bobby. It was Stan. Flair, the Road Wars were there, Dusty was there, JJ was there, Tully was there. The whole goddamn shit and shooting shitting match, whole goddamn shooting match of the top guys. He's gonna fly to St. Martin for four days. And I'm here in Flair, because Flair's been down there, right? But then I should have realized he he went back after he goddamn nearly got killed wrestling Jack Venino down there to that part of the world. Well, that was the Dominican Republic. Well, same goddamn thing. No. It's in that direction. They're all very different. Well, I don't I wouldn't be surprised if somebody almost didn't get killed in St. Martin. But the point is, they've been saying, oh, it's great. It's an island, it's a resort area, it's an island, it's tropical. I'm thinking Hawaii, right? Because that year in 87, when I got married, went on my honeymoon, went to Hawaii. Look at this guy, regular I'm, regular Colin Thompson over here flying well, all yeah. around. So I'm thinking now Crockett's going to get, and, and he paid for the tickets for you and your wife, right? So I'm thinking, well, well this will be fun. It'll be like Hawaii. Oh, no, it wasn't. No matter how much flair and these guys that have been there and worked Florida territory, whatever, promoing it, we get there. It's not like Hawaii. It's not low humidity and pleasant weather. It's oppressive fucking heat and it's air you wear. And whereas in Hawaii, they had even the Denny's restaurant didn't have a wall on it. They just want all the open air because they don't have bugs. They don't have snakes. Whatever the fuck they got on this goddamn island, you need to watch out for it. And and uh, chances are the insects can carry you off. More on that in a minute. Just going from the airport to our resort area, we're passing neighborhoods where there are junked cars in the front yards with goats standing on them so that they can eat leaves out of the trees without having to stand up on their hind legs. Kind of fucking neighborhoods. What's wrong with that? Do you have that up there in Jersey near the last manor? No, but, you know, it could take Goats off. on junked cars eating out of the trees? Well, there are goats that climb trees. I've seen that, but... um. You know why they were eating out of the trees? Because the food that they served you would make you sick down there. <laughs> Because it made me sick, and I had a cast iron fucking facility at that point in time. <laughs> and here's something else. They don't give you hotel rooms, and they don't really give you your own cabin. They have these beachfront cabana cabin type things where there's two individual rooms or areas for people, and they have a common porch, right? And the first night that I'm there, we walk back from dinner or whatever the fuck, because they said, don't leave the resort. The resort area is okay. You don't want to go into town unless you want to buy some discount electronics, but sounds like Jamaica. In the daytime. Sounds like Jamaica. Yeah. So we come back to this porch and I see a goddamn spider the size of my hand on the door of the room right next to ours on this combined porch. And I grab a goddamn stick and whack this spider, and it just drops down, shakes its head, sells momentarily, and runs under the crack in the door to the room next to us that I don't know whether somebody's in there sleeping or not. <laughs> and I'm like, I've gotten it now. I've forced a goddamn potentially poisonous spider into their goddamn room. It's like a Bond movie. <laughs> and I'm like, open our door, act naturally, say nothing, get inside. And then I look and I realize 
There's a goddamn inch high crack under the door, the door to the front porch, out into the tropics, into the jungle, into naked and afraid country. There's a fucking inch crack under the fucking door, and that's why apparently they've got the heavy-duty can of bug spray that came in the room. It was already in there. So I've spent the entire time we were in the room stuffing goddamn towels under that crack in the door and spraying them, soaking them with bug spray. I'm not even going to mention. <laughs> that sounds hazardous. It, well, it, 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 it was hard to breathe, but I didn't want to open a goddamn window. A goddamn tsetse <laughs> fly or a fucking vampire <laughs> bat may fly in. <laughs> Then my wife wanted to take the fucking boat trip where they're going to cook us a goddamn, what's that French culinary school? The Cordon Bleu. Right, of course. They're going to, a Cordon Bleu chef is going to take us on a boat to a sandbar and cook us a goddamn Cordon Bleu meal. Well, the, I don't know about the cordon, but the meal blew all right. It was, the portions were so tiny and the food was so greasy that I ended up on a sandbar with no bathroom and no toilet on this fucking boat that had no cover on it, which led to the fucking worst sunburn I'd ever gotten in my life. And that's when I believe I told you one time I had to go across the fucking sand dune and take a angry fucking Russo and wipe <laughs> my ass with my fucking tube sock. <laughs> and then came back just in time to goddamn <laughs> feel the sunburn that I couldn't even have sheets on my body and then we got a to-go cheeseburger they put goat cheese on it i thought the meat was ruined i threw the whole thing out and then realized it was some kind of goat cheese that these fucking perverted twisted <laughs> deviant minds down here give to people unsuspecting when they think they're gonna get a piece of regular cheese on a goddamn burger they've just asked to take home to their fucking infested with insects <laughs> fucking deadly fucking poisonous room where they can lay there and shiver and be in pain and blister and their skin peel off their body. But no, I got goat cheese and I threw the burger out the window because I thought the meat was ruined. <laughs> and then we came back to Pittsburgh. <laughs> So that was, that was 1987 in St. Martin at the NWA meeting. And again, by the way, they here now the people at this resort, right? And they're used to, I guess, these businesses coming and doing this thing. So they send at nine o'clock the first morning or whatever, they send uh, 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 vans, shuttles to pick everybody up at the at the uh, front desk check-in area and then take them over to the meeting room and we go in the meeting room and these long tables where everybody can sit at and then you've got the table with a screen uh, like if they want to use a projector you can pull the screen down and the podium at the front and they've got notepads with pens next to all the chairs and they've got a pitcher of water on every table and glasses and they sit down. Crockett's got, I'm, I'm sure Elliot Mernick was there and probably Carl Mernick and, and the local promoters. Not Henry Marcus never made it to any of these. And they call briefly the meeting to order. And the, most of the talent is not involved in anything. We're just sitting there. And they made a couple of motions and passed the motions. And then they got on the fucking house phone and they called the guy that's from the hotel, from the resort back. Can you come back? And he comes in like five minutes later, say, yes, you need something. They said, we're done oh, for the day. No, for the whole fucking time. That was the goddamn convention meeting. And they wrote the rest of it off and guys are doing jet skis and they're fucking riding around a motorcycle and they're drinking at the cabana bar and they're going into town for cheap electronics. And I'm trying to evade goddamn poisonous fucking reptiles and insects and couldn't wait to get the fuck out of that place and would never, ever think about going there ever again. Well, don't worry. There was no NWA convention to attend at 88. And there sure wasn't. But I'll tell you where I was in 1988 on September 17th. I'll have you know. I was in Charleston, South Carolina. And the Midnight Express was doing a job for the Road Warriors. The house was $41,000, and we got $415 apiece. <laughs> wow. 
$415. That's cutting it right down to the nub, as Dennis used to say. That's where they say, well, we've given you everything we can. Could Dennis, one time in world class, he got a $63 payoff because he worked the tag match and the captain's match. So we got $50, but for the extra singles match, he got $13 fucking dollars on a spot show. But this week was a little bit more noteworthy than just being in Charleston, South Carolina. Would you like to know what I did my entire birthday week in 1988? The entire week? Well, just because it's, it's, it, I'm not going to go into granular detail, but it was very eventful because, as you'll recall, the week before that, Saturday, September 10th, we went to Philadelphia and did a little thing called beating Tully and Arn for the World Tag Team title. That's right. That was completely unplanned because of obviously Tully and Arn's situation. And we covered that here not long ago. As a matter of fact, there had been a clash of champions live on TBS on September 7th. They didn't put that match on there because Dusty didn't want the people to see it live on TV. He wanted them to pay to see it. And they were, Richmond had been great, and Greensboro was great, and Norfolk was up, and Baltimore did $123,000. Detroit did $70,000. We did a hundred and, what was it, a hundred and ten in Charlotte. But anyway, so our bookings that week, it's kind of weird because it reflects the fact that nobody knew this was coming. The, the night in Philly... The house was $72,000. That was about, for those days, 6,500, 7,000 people. Not great for Philly, but not horrible. We did that, and then the, the next day was a double shot. We did syndicated TV in Fayetteville, North Carolina, the NWA, uh, NWA Pro Show that would air on September 24th, so two weeks ahead of time. And uh, also the NWA Worldwide. So we did a match and an interview against Job Guys and just talked about winning the belts on both those shows because it had just happened. And then that night, we were against the Fantastics in Greensboro, where it, that, that was a substitution where it had been advertised, Tully and Arn. And we had to do a, basically a double pin and the referee raised our hands, which was kind of the same thing we did with Tully and Arn, but that was because they're like, what the fuck? Now we are they baby faces or heels? What the fuck's going on? So then... Yeah, how did you work that match? Well, we had to kind of, even though... See, here's the problem. We had had the program with the Fantastics earlier in the year, all those great matches everybody remembers, the Clash of Champions, the one that FTR said was that they loved so much that uh, Meltzer said, uh, you know, was the best TV match until FTR and the Bullet Club Gold. We'd done all that with us straight heels and them straight baby faces from March through July. Now we're coming back and rehashing when we've already done an angle with Tully and Arn that makes us baby faces. And to be honest, we had proven we could beat the, mid the Fantastics. And so the people were... They weren't hooting them out of the building, but they were either cheering for us or just kind of sitting on their hands about it. And that didn't make for a good atmosphere. And the people knew in the kind of way that the fans that even when they weren't smart back in those days knew that the Fantastics ain't going to win these things right now. It was, a, it was thrown back with them just because there was nothing else right now. And so, when's, when's the New Orleans match with the Road Warriors? end of October, almost Halloween. So we had to be kind of floating for about six weeks. And that was the, the difficult part. <laughs> but, and that's, and here's another thing I mentioned, okay, we're in Philly on Saturday night. We win the belts. We go Sunday Fayetteville and do two hours of TV taping in the afternoon and a house show in Greensboro that night. I had already scheduled myself that's the week that i did the fill-in morning shows on wbcy radio in charlotte with jj mckay who was the afternoon guy the morning team was on vacation so four out of five of the mornings this week i was already committed to doing fucking four hours of morning radio so i'm getting up at four o'clock in the morning to drive over to the station right and be there by the time we go on at six o'clock so i've done philly we're on Crockett's plane. 
We've flown back to Dunfayetteville and Greensboro on Sunday. I do the morning radio on Monday. Then I go to Greenville, South Carolina that night. We work a title match with the Fantastics where we go over. Then I get home fucking midnight, 1230. I'm up at four again. I do the morning radio on Tuesday. Then we do another TV taping in Columbia, South Carolina on Tuesday night where we do not only two TV shows, but also a dark match with the Fantastics. Then back to Charlotte, which is an hour and a half, so I'm home by 11.30. But then the next morning, I do the radio again and then drive to Atlanta. And this was where they started doing Atlanta TV on weekday nights for whatever fucking bizarre purpose. So we're still at the studio. We're not at center stage yet, but we have Atlanta TV on Wednesday night and Thursday night. And I couldn't go back to Charlotte and do this. So I called in on the phone for a while on the radio show on Thursday morning. And then after the taping on Thursday night, I drove back to Charlotte and did the morning radio on Friday morning, six to 10 again, and then got in the car and we went to Richmond, Virginia, which was 300 fucking miles and did a match that was supposed to be with Tully and Arn and worked with the Fantastics and then went to Charleston that Saturday, my birthday, the match with the Road Warriors, and then we're in Roanoke, Virginia, which is almost as far as you can get in the territory from Charleston, South Carolina, on Sunday the 18th, where we were back working with the Fantastics instead of as a replacement for Tully and Arn. So that was an interesting fucking week. Did you have to clear that with the office, or they don't care what kind of things you do like that in your office? Well, no, well, no here's the thing. We were in Charlotte, right? So obviously, Tom Sorensen at the Charlotte Observer was doing the regular wrestling column in the newspaper, which was at the time, may still be the biggest newspaper in the state, at a regular wrestling column. All the guys were were encouraged to do publicity. They were celebrities. And so when, um, when they asked me from, because Cat Collins had been had worked for that radio station also and they knew that their morning team would uh was going to go on vacation and I think it may, it may have been Cat said so I think he was there then uh but he may have said something about I get cornet oh yeah so they asked me to do it and they had the regular afternoon guy switch to mornings because he knew how to work all the shit and they just said just be yourself so I told you know, Crockett and Dusty, I said, I'm going to be the morning guy on the fucking one of the most popular radio stations in town for a week. And they said, yes, sell the matches, plug the fucking shit. And I did. I, I talked about the Midnight Express, talked about the matches, talked about the wrestling program. Any they guests? Care. Any guests? Did you ask Flair to come on or anything? Uh, but what? No. Are you? None of those guys were going to get up and come up in there with that schedule that early in the fucking morning. No. And I, I didn't Not have in the, the studio, but even if they call in. Well, but I'm, I didn't, they didn't give me the power to invite people and program the whole thing. I'm, I'm sidekicking the fucking afternoon guy. And we came up with bits as we went. We actually did call U.S. Air because U.S. Air had a hub in Charlotte at that point in time. And that was the big airline. They had absorbed Piedmont Airlines and everything. And we said, we're calling from WBCY Radio, our regular morning guys. I can't remember their name, Frick and Frack. They're going to be flying back in from their vacation next Monday. Can you reroute all incoming planes from California to fucking Beckley, West Virginia? And then we're going to strand them up there and sort it out later so we can keep doing the show. And this was live on the, 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 the U.S. Air people didn't see the humor in that situation. Maybe you didn't either. Welcome to U.S. Air. It was funnier when we did it. <laughs> Well, happy happy birthday. Was, yeah, yeah. Well, you want to go any further? I got more. 89. Hold on. Babyface Jim Cornette in 89. Let's go to 1989, because on September 17th, we were in El Paso, Texas, working with the Freebirds of Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin in a house that, on a house that was so bad that it, I didn't even record it for a $150 payoff. Cause of course that Ooh. was the, well, but here's the thing. 
and we were all on guarantees. This was the Turner Broadcasting days, the TBS, the Jim Hurd era. So they would give you a payoff on the show based on what the payoff would be if it was the house that you drew like in the old days, but you were still on a guaranteed fucking contract anyway. So all the payoffs were abysmal. Nobody, the Memphis crew wouldn't have worked WCW for the payoffs if they didn't have guarantees. Because, all, listen to this. We're, hold on. We had done, and this was when Flair had just strong-armed his way into the book and taken over the booking team. Because so the that means you're on the booking team. Exactly. I had just started. Because it, everything was abysmal, right? I will, I'll just start at the 1st of September. Um, was, uh, we were in Nashville, Tennessee on Labor Day. Didn't even record the house. We had $200 payoff. Huntsville, Alabama, $23,000, $200. Alexandria, Louisiana, $200. Biloxi, Mississippi, $25,000. All these Midnight Express versus the Freebirds, the two hottest teams ever in Mid-South Wrestling. Nobody wanted to see any of this shit. Miami, Florida did $15,000 for Midnight versus the Freebirds and me versus Paul Heyman. I'm, uh, I can't imagine that the uh, the building wasn't fifteen thousand dollars rent. Then we went to Palmetto, Florida, and did fifteen seven, and then Fort Pierce, Florida, couldn't even record the house. Two hundred and fifty dollar payoff. The contract payment for me alone that week was twenty eight hundred dollars. So that was the the shortfall. And what? Greenwood, South Carolina, $11,000. Columbia, South Carolina, this is where I was going. September 12th was the Clash of Champions Fall Brawl. It was the eighth Clash of Champions. That's where Flair put me and Jim Ross in on color for the Clash of Champions episodes. And that's where he really started redirecting the 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 creative for the pay-per-views and the the shows the booking etc but we were still in a horrendous position with the live dates the live tours and events uh we were supposed to be in warner robbins georgia on september 13th they just canceled it and then we did atlanta tv on thursday the 14th and then they sent us to corpus christi texas on friday the 15th they had a full card of all these guys that were on $1,500, $2,000, $2,500, $3,000 a week guarantees. And we sold out the old building in Corpus Christi, but it was $28,000 house. They lost money on a sellout. And then we went to Lubbock and did $12,000 on Saturday the 16th. And then on Sunday, we were in, in El Paso, for the 17th and did again as $150 payoff. And I'm not even recording these houses. They're abysmal. They're literally like a thousand people, 1500 people, 750 people. And the 18th, we were in Roanoke, Virginia for a TV taping. The 19th, we were off the 20th. We did Atlanta TV. <laughs> the 21st, we were off the 22nd. Finally, we were in Asheville, North Carolina, did a $41,000 house. And th that was, uh, but uh, we were supposed to work with the Freebirds, but Garvin was hurt. So it was a single match with Stan and Michael Hayes. And then we were supposed to go to Richmond on Saturday, the 23rd, but the plane was canceled. And we were supposed to be in Charlotte on the 24th. But the show was canceled because do you remember what happened then, Brian? What happened? September 1989. I don't remember. Hurricane Hugo. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the storm canceled the Charlotte show on the 24th. And then we picked up Johnstown, Pennsylvania on the Monday, the 25th for another TV taping. So this was just, it was incredible. We, they, they went to Worcester, Massachusetts with a full WCW card on a Wednesday night and did $7,100. As that was so bad that they didn't even give the contract guys a token payoff on that town. 
they lost so much money they had to buy their way out of the building that night. So they didn't even have anything to record a token payoff for the talent out of that show. And then we were in Troy, New York the next day, not for the clash, Syracuse, New York, and Buffalo and Rochester. And the only fucking town that drew was Buffalo and drawing for that was $32,000. And then we were in Salisbury, Maryland for another TV taping, and I remember riding with Flair and Kevin Sullivan where he was beyond ballistic about... He was getting the ratings up. The clash had been well-received, and the ratings that was up, and it looked good for creative and the pay-per-view and et cetera, but he wasn't in control of the goddamn towns. And he said, we could go to Gaffney, South Carolina and draw better than we were in Worcester fucking Massachusetts, and we'd be an hour from the house. And, it, you know, so that was the, the problem is WCW, they couldn't put live events together to save their lives, and the towns that they picked, I think somebody told me at one point, were based off the local ratings they did in that town, rather than whether anybody in that town might buy a ticket to see them live. It was all about TV for them. And they ignored all the great drawing towns that we had traditionally gone to, the ones they hadn't already killed, to go to these new markets where they say, oh, but people are watching us. Yeah, well, they ain't coming to buy a ticket. Maybe it's because you can't promote a show. Maybe it's because nobody knows we're here. Maybe it's because you're going to a building so big that 2,000 people looks like a piss hole in a snowbank. Talking to Jim Hurd or Tony. I was about to say, 35 years later, people still haven't learned. How about 1990 is a good one? Okay. 1990, Flair has already said fuck it and quit the book, <laughs> as you'll recall. Told, I wrote his letter for him, told her, fuck it, you promised me control. And That was at the beginning of the year. Yeah, that, well, that was in February, and then I followed in March. And then the Midnight and I tried to leave in May, but every, all the agents and everybody on the booking committee overruled Heard and voted unanimously to offer us a new contract, so we were stuck. So we were trying to make the best of it. So now Ole is booking because they've gone through another committee and then they brought Ole back. And as you will recall, um, Ole decided, well... Heard don't like him, and I ain't going to die on that hill, so I'm just either going to beat him or not use him at all. So we had a lot more time off over that period of time. But, for example, again, in the 10 days before my birthday, starting with September 7th, we were in Amarillo, Texas, against Hector Guerrero and Terry Taylor, $250 payoff. Again, we're on guaranteed contracts, but this shows that none of these towns are drawing any money. I don't even have the houses recorded. I wasn't interested enough to stay to the end of some of these shows to see what the fucking figure was. Then we were in Lubbock, Texas on the 8th. Same thing. Fort Worth on the 9th. The payoff was worse. My contract payment that week or that uh, period was... $3,394. That meant for that two-week period, they were $3,400 short on what they owed me just on the payoffs I had from the house shows. Then we came back and did Gainesville, Georgia TV on Monday the 10th. And then we were booked for Dayton, Ohio on the 11th, Canton, Ohio on the 12th, and Portsmouth, Ohio on the 13th. And I wrote here that I was pissed off, pissed in parentheses. I called him and said, fuck you, I'm sick. Because <laughs> I was mad. And I didn't go. And they didn't care. That's how bad it was getting at that point. But then finally, I believe, I talked myself into going back on the road and showed up in Columbus on the 14th and as another $200 payoff. And then we were in Detroit, Michigan on the, third, on the uh, 15th of September, Brian. Detroit, Michigan, the house was $13,000. That was not 1,000 people. And we worked with poor Brian Pillman and Tom Zink. And then 
The next day, we were in Hammond, Indiana. And that wasn't even $13,000, right? And again, with Pillman and Zinc. And so we're either being beaten like a drum, or a lot of times we would show up for tag matches with people, but the other the opponents wouldn't give a fuck enough to show up at this point, so they just have us in single matches, and nothing's going on, right? And I'm getting cranky. And then we show up on Monday, September 17th in Marietta, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta, for another TV taping, because at that that's all the fuck we were doing at that point was these TV tapings. And, and then going to tours in some part of the country where nobody was fucking coming, right? But at least we're either off more or we've only got one match a night or, you know, we're not killing ourselves because there's nobody there watching. But on my birthday, we get to Marietta. Guess how many matches we had in one night at a TV taping? Three. Five. Wait a minute, hold on. Let me make sure I'm right. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, I'm right. Because do you remember when they had the Friday night power hour on TBS and the Saturday night WCW show and Sunday night's main event? It was a Jim Ross idea, bless his little heart, that some wrestler would be chosen to try to run, run the, the gauntlet. gauntlet. Yeah, you got to run the gauntlet. That's right. And if he beat somebody on Friday night and Saturday night and Sunday night, he would win a goddamn cash prize or a brand new car or some fucking blow job from, I don't know, whatever. And so on this night, they were taping not only the three W uh, uh, or TBS shows for the weekend, but we were also booked in a dark match and also, they were doing syndication and wanted to stand to work a single match. So, on the Bobby Eaton is running the gauntlet. On the Power Hour, he has a match with Tracy Smothers. And another, uh, a baby face, right? Because we're fucking, at this point, we're heels again. And Tracy goes to come off the top rope, and I shake the rope, and Tracy falls, and Bobby pins him. So Bobby advances. And then on the Saturday night show, it's Bobby Eaton versus Ricky Morton. And they do a 15-minute Broadway. And then it's announced there's going to be a five-minute overtime. And Stan comes to the ring and distracts the referee, and I hold the fucking tennis racket into the corner for Bobby to run Ricky, but Ricky shoves Bobby into it and then nails me and then cross-bodies Bobby. But the referee turns around and sees me laying there and as he comes to me, Stan gets up, and Ricky grabs him, and Bobby gives St uh, Ricky a knee in the back, and Ricky and Stan have a double knockout, and Bobby schoolboys Ricky and advances. And then he advances to the Sunday night main event show where now it's Bobby Eaton versus Sid Vicious. And this was the worst Bobby Eaton match I've ever seen. And he tried his best, but it was Sid. And Sid went over, obviously. The whole thing was to get Sid over and to have Bobby provide 45 fucking minutes of goddamn programming over the weekend in one night. And I mean, Sid was so stiff and so fucking fired up at himself at that point when he was so green. He did the deal where he shoved me, and he shoved me so hard I was flying so far back I did what you never do because I was panicked. I'd never gone this fast before, and I put my hands behind my back to catch myself and almost hyperextended my elbow from a fucking chest shove, right? So Bobby had to put him over. Then we also, Stan, as I mentioned, had a singles match in syndication with Terry Taylor where Terry Sunset flipped him and beat him. And then... We had a dark match against Rick and Scott Steiner where we did the same finish that we had done in the Meadowlands in August when we dropped the U.S. tag team title to them, and that was the main event dark match. So five fucking matches in one night in Marietta at the Cobb County Civic Center. <sighs>
And then that week we were back in Jasper, Georgia, and Rock Hill, Sa Rock Hill South Carolina did a $3,000 house. That means that the ticket prices that WCW was charging at that point, they didn't have 250 people. And you would leave WCW a little while after that, and you would start Smoky Mountain in 92. So 91, you're working indie dates, you're setting up Smoky. Where were you on your birthday? I was not anywhere on 19, because in 1991, if I went through and counted, which I haven't, besides the Memphis dates that we did in January, February, and into March, I may have worked six or eight shows in 1991. And I was nowhere on my birthday, day, but I was in 1993. I was somewhere in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Remember when I said that September 1993 was the worst after I'd set the record for the best Smoky Mountain house in August of 93 with me and Bullet Bob in the Lumberjack match, then September was the worst, and it was Bob and Terry Funk because the psychology was off. They didn't want to see me get revenge on Bob. They wanted to see me, him get revenge on me, and they did. But we had to start something else. Well, in September, I was not going to ask Terry Funk to fly from Amarillo, Texas to Johnson City, Tennessee for a Saturday show he'd had to leave at fucking Thursday at 2 o'clock, right? Because we had Johnson City running at Freedom Hall as a Friday night. September 17th, we did a $2 kids ticket. Because September, back to school, they got to buy the kids clothes and books and all that shit. It's always sucked. And... I had a regular card. We had the Heavenly Bodies against the Rock and Roll Express. We had the Armstrongs against the Bruise Brothers, Tracy Smothers against Brian Lee for the Smoky Mountain title. But we also had a Loser Leave Smoky Mountain wrestling match between Bob Armstrong and Jim Cornette's secret weapon. Because I had to fucking... I started the thing with, with Bob and Terry, but also I had to get Bob Armstrong out of Smoky Mountain so we could bring the bullet back, right? So Bob Armstrong says, I tell you what, I'll bring Larry Santo up with me. When Bob rode up, he picked up Larry Santo in Chattanooga. Larry Santo was a wrestler, but he wasn't working in Smoky Mountain at the time. Bob liked to work with him on the indie shows in Alabama, and he had a ninja outfit. So my black ninja beat Bob Armstrong so that Bullet Bob would have to come back with a mask on later on. Because we knew we were going to do what we were going to do, and we did 855 paid and 114 comps. And it, it, it sucked, but it got, we got the footage and it got the point across. But that's what I did my birthday that, that year. Is that a lot of comps for Johnson City? Um, well, see, we had sponsors and radio. See, we got... Normally, we would have had 30 or 40 maybe because you give the radio station, like the country station, you give them 10 pair and they'll give them away. And then you give the rock station 10 pair and they'll give them away. And that's the most you're going to give away. But we had, and I'd have to go to the fucking event file, but in Johnson City, was it, oh, God damn it, who was it? We had Mrs. Winters in Knoxville. There was some sponsor that as part of them paying us money, we would provide them with X amount of tickets. So they weren't necessarily comped, but we pulled them without selling them through the box office. So that is, and technically that is a comp ticket. Nobody paid for it individually, but there is sometimes an asterisk there. And that may be something with the WWE also with the large number of comps when they've got Snickers all over their goddamn did they give the, the Snickers factory 500 tickets to have all the kids come down and say, who knows, right? But to give that many, sometimes they're just papering, but we never, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, nor Ohio Valley Wrestling, or anything I was in charge of, we never papered specifically to look good because if it was that bad, it wasn't going to help us anyway, and we didn't want to set the precedent coming back to the same place constantly that you could get free tickets if 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 nobody bought them they'll give them away for free we don't want people to think that but if fucking classy motors or mrs winter's chicken or spectrum rents it might have been spectrum in johnson city spectrum rents we had a banner if they want to give us 
a thousand or two thousand dollars a month and they want 40 tickets to the show well they're they're going to have them in their store and if somebody comes in and buys something they're going to give them a free wrestling ticket well that's not necessarily hitting our target audience necessarily so it's not taking people away from us does that make any sense makes lots of sense and as we've talked about on the all in all out were they all in or all out fiasco with the discrepancy in the attendance a lot a high percentage of comp tickets don't come because they got them from the radio station or they got them from a sponsor or they don't have anything invested they may not be able to get a babysitter they just they wanted to call and answer the question whatever the fuck right because there have been wrestling promotions before that have passed out like thousands of comp tickets, but ran a building that seated maybe 800 and still didn't have a riot because you're, you're hoping that maybe you get 20% or 25% if you're just trying to paper something like that. But anyway, that was there. And then the following day, we were in Phelps, Kentucky. Oh, joy, oh, bliss. But that was 1993. I got, I got, well, hold on. I got two more. You want to hear two more? Yeah. Because 1994. Oh, Again. Bo oh, boy. <laughs> Smoky Mountain Wrestling. <laughs> well, no, it was better. It was better in a way because we didn't have a shitty show in Knoxville in September because we had realized from the previous two years that. Uh, back to, and also the Tennessee Valley Fair. I didn't even mention back to school, September, the, the month after the big August blowout show and the Tennessee Valley Fair, because in 1994, for the first of two years, we got a show sold to the Tennessee Valley Fair. So instead of trying to run against them, we were part of it. And they gave us $4,500 for the show, which was like, since we didn't have to advertise it, we didn't have to rent the Coliseum, we didn't have any expenses other than bringing the boys to the to the fairgrounds and having the show, it was like drawing, you know, $8,500 in at the Coliseum, and that was better than we'd done the year before with Terry Funk. And we just, I, I, they wanted girls, so we had Leilani Kai work with Susan Green, and then me and Killer Kyle had a handicap match against Bullet Bob, Brian Lee and Chris Candido in a grudge match, Dirty White Boy and Bruiser for the Bruiser Bedlam for the Smoky Mountain title, and the Rock and Roll Express and the Gangstas for the Smoky Mountain tag title. And because that was unfortunately, I had I had gotten that far ahead with what I had plotted out when Jericho broke his arm and I had to change the thrill seekers out, and that changed it because originally it was going to be the rock and roll and the gangsters, but the thrill seekers against Candido and potentially a, a partner to be named for the tag team title. And that would end up turning into Boo Bradley. But nevertheless, wow, those would have really been interesting matches. Storm and Jericho in 94 against Candido and future balls Mahoney. I mean, he was wrestling a different style as Boo Bradley, obviously. But uh, but unfortunately, Jericho decided to fucking practice his backflips and screwed the whole thing up. But yeah, I'd, I'd had a, uh, as a matter of fact, I went to Atlanta as a matter of, yes, September 12th, I went to Atlanta. I was there the 12th and the 13th and the 14th because um, not only did I take a little break at that point in time, but also that's when I went down and talked to Ole and shot the interviews with Bryant Anderson, his son. You mean, that's, Bryant, you mean that's when Ole got fired? Yes. And that's when I wiped the booger on Bischoff's uh, Corvette windshield. Um, but yeah, that's uh, I went down and shot those interviews because then he started, uh, I believe, at the... Uh, did I have him start at TV or was he at house shows? He started the house shows... Uh, on October 1st, Bryant did. Tracy and Bryant Anderson. And then Ole made the TV on October 3rd in Morganton, North Carolina. Let, actually, here's the uh, lineup I had in, on TV in Morganton, North Carolina. Ole Anderson, Bob Armstrong, Ron Wright, Les Thatcher, Jim Ross, Cactus Jack, Ricky Morton, Robert Gibson, 
New Jack and Mustafa, the Gangstas, Dirty White Boy, Lance Storm, Brian Lee, Boo Bradley, who would later become, as you mentioned, Balls Mahoney, Sonny, Tammy Fitch, Tracy Smothers, Bryant Anderson, did I mention Bruiser Bedlam, uh, Sean Casey, George South, and uh, a variety of job guys. Not bad for Morganton at the rec center. Did the Hardys work there as a job guys? Then? Um, you know what? They, based, based on where it was? I think they, that may be the taping. Yeah, either that one or we did. It was a North Carolina TV. I'm flipping through my fucking book now. We were in Morganton a couple of times, and we also did TV in Lenore. It may have been there. But nevertheless, uh, so two... Three days in Atlanta, dealing with Ole, shooting interviews with Bryant, came back and did the Tennessee Valley Fair on September 16th. And then in, on the 17th, I was in Barberville, Kentucky at the Knox Central High School. Tickets, by the way, were available at the Marathon Pit Stop and the Chestnut Tax Service because Dennis Chestnut was our local sponsor and he could get anything done up there. And uh, that's where I spent my birthday on in 1994. And one more, just for shits and grins, because I, I see after that, in in the WWF, I was not on the road doing house shows. It was TV and pay per view and working in the office. So, and most of the time, you know. Uh, uh, the schedule in the modern era has modified where people don't run weeknights as many times anymore. So either I wasn't really working on my birthday or I was only behind the scenes or whatever. But, and then in OVW, I became available to, or became able to take my birthday off. But I like this one that I took off because, hold on, who is it? The date of, yes. I took off September 17th, 2003. I noted that I picked up a rental car on Friday and my vacation started on Saturday the 13th. And I'm pretty sure that that's one of the times that Stace and I went up to the Poconos. But nevertheless, because it was a small operation, I was not only the booker in OVW, but also the lead announcer if I wasn't there, they couldn't do TV on camera. And if Danny Davis wasn't there, they couldn't do TV off camera. So once a year, either I would take off or he would take off. And then we'd try to have two weeks break at, uh, at Christmas. But in this case, we did a best of OBW television show to air on September 20th, because we normally would have taped on the 17th. And the best of show while I was out of town on WBKI, did a 1.7 rating and a 3.4 share with the highest quarter being a 2.2. While the, remember the WWE, what did they call their last syndicated program? WWE Mental, or Jacked, or Metal, yeah, or I'm not sure. Fucking aggravate. I've got it here. I used to write the whole fucking title, but then I just I started keeping track because the WWE syndication was on a different station on the same day, Saturday. They were 11 in the morning. We were 11 at night. So I would keep track of what they were doing. And the same day that we did a 1.7 rating and a 3.4 share with the highest quarter being a 2.2, they did a 1.0 rating and a 2.5 share with their highest quarter being a 1.1. So fuck them. And that was 2003. That was my birthday present. We beat their ratings. But otherwise, well, that's a tour through some of my past, my checkered past. A deep dive into the birthday history of Jim Cornette. You sound... Bored. I told you it was going to go my way today. I didn't say I was bored. And again, it's your show. It always goes your way on your show. 